Thunder Rising, we have some very important topics to get in with you this morning. Brianna, do the honors. We have some breaking news for you. CNN chairman and, C uh, and CEO Chris Lake is reportedly out at the network and will be replaced in the interim by top executive Amy Intellis. CNN informed employees of the move during an editorial call this morning. Lick's parting comes in the week after a cringeworthy profile of the CEO appeared in The Atlantic, prompting Lick to apologize to CNN staff. Lick was also weakened by the network's town hall with Donald Trump, which drew ire from Democrats who slammed the network for platforming the former president. Though, as journalist Glenn Greenwald points out, CNN was in muddy waters well before Licht was hired, tweeting, media figures are flagrantly rewriting the history of CNN right before your eyes to make it seem as if CNN only started failing when Chris Licht was hired and demanded it stop being a DNC activist group. CNN was already in free fall and collapse when Licht was hired. Mm. Right. So, I think the story of Chris Licht, who was at CNN about a year, um, is correctly, or at least partly correctly, diagnosing some of the problems with the network without offering necessarily a solution. Um, a lot of the things he tried out didn't work. Obviously, the infamous pairing or trio of of uh, Don Lemon, Poppy Harlow, Caitlin Collins, what, which was his idea was a complete disaster. The three did not get along well at all. They, did, they, they didn't mesh well. Um, Don Lemon was very, was <laughs> allegedly very, um, uh, showed a lot of contempt for his uh, female uh, mm -hmm. co-host. Obviously, there was the past her prime moment. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of berating uh, when cameras weren't rolling. And then there was actually even some berating while cameras were rolling, um, uh, just the different, the different kind of approaches they took. Don Lemon had a kind of, um, you know, how, how, how can we even be normalizing Republicanism and, and right. Trumpism that was sort of at odds with, with what Caitlin Collins and Poppy Harlow Yeah, it was purely were ideological do. and yeah. no an analysis right. whatsoever. But Chris Licht also then fired Don Lemon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he, Chris Licht seemed to take the view that CNN had lost too much um, uh, rapport with normal, moderate, and Republican and conservative people who were not going to turn on CNN anymore because it was just so relentlessly partisan, so so obsessed with Trump and how Trump is a disease and a fascist and all of that um, in a way that was just so, that was, that had veered off course from CNN being the place you just turn on when there's news. Mm -hmm. you, you just want, you know, you know, give it to me straight, Doc, kind of thing. Yeah. However, um, I, I don't know that he was really making steps to solve that issue, to because I'm not sure CNN was regaining credibility with conservatives in any meaningful way over the last year. So if it was just alienating the audience it did have of, of resistance liberals, and it was frustrating the staff that they were being told to be more moderate or centrist. And also, you can be moderate and centrist and and then and, and then lose your perspective and actually not be fun to watch. Like we always right. talk about how if you're just everybody has has views and opinions and perspectives, and if you're pretending you don't, it actually makes for bad television. Yeah, being being a cheerleader, stop deciding to stop cheerleading Democratic Party does not mean being moderate or centrist. It means understanding that there is a quadrant of that proverbial chart right. of where American political sympathies lie that is being unfulfilled. If you have one axis that it's about economic populism versus economic conservatism, and one axis that's about social conservatism and social liberalism, we have socially conservative, economically conservative Republicans. Traditionally, we have socially liberal, economically liberal Democrats, mm -hmm. ostensibly. Traditionally. And then there's these CNN type liberals who think, well, the answer to our messaging problems is to be economically conservative and socially liberal. Mm -hmm. Zero people exist in that space. That's mm -hmm. the space where the brain geniuses who are thinking of things like uh, the CEO of JP Morgan running for president, that's what they occupy. They, they think that that's the Bloomberg presidency is going mm -hmm. to solve the American public's problem by occupying that space. But when you look at a scatter plot of where Americans lie, nobody's there. Where there is a cluster of people who are not being served by any of the, either of the two traditional groups, is this kind of economic populism, um, culture war, socially conservative area. And 
I don't know that any network has figured out how to appeal to that group of people. I also think that group of people is pretty undefined because even within that group, it's unclear what their priorities are. How much do you really care about some of the, the cultural stuff mm -hmm. as compared to the economic stuff? But the point is that they're unwilling to be economically populist. No corporate news show is really actually willing to be economically populist. So they do stunts like having a town hall with uh, with Donald Trump that alienates Trump voters because there's clear hostility between the host of the debate and Donald Trump. There's an unwillingness to put Trump in a position where he's actually responsive to the Trump voters and the audience in a true town hall format. So it just looks like more antagonism between establishment conservatives like Caitlin Collins is at least perceived to be or, and the liberals at CNN and Donald Trump instead of actually having a sincere engagement with the kind of economic populist ideas, good faith or not, that galvanized the public into supporting him in the first place in 2016. Until they learn that message, I don't know how many CEOs they're going to run through, but the CEO in and of itself isn't the problem here, in my view. Well, I mean, the CEO has tremendous power to hire new talent, replace old talent, um, you know, give marching orders to the team. I think a CEO who actually got it could do a lot of good. Perhaps, although I'm skeptical, honestly, that a network can draw, like it's television, can draw a lot of new viewers because, like, young people are not, they're not turning, they don't even have cable subscriptions anymore. Um, they're looking, they're, uh, they're seeking, I, I mean, that's maybe what makes me skeptical of your, like, your quadrant theory. Like, are those people, people who turn on their, I guess if they're older people, maybe they're people who are watching TV, they're probably watching Fox News. Well, and I, they're not gonna go over to see Well, the, the idea in part or was. Or they're watching YouTube and they're on Rumble. That, and, that was part of the idea, yeah. I think, of moving to a CNN Plus, moving to a web-based subscription service is that you have some appreciation of the fact that people are getting their TV through other means, but they're still watching it. People are still watching Tucker Carlson clips, you know, whatever the mm -hmm. viral clip from The View is or whatever. They're just watching it on YouTube, which they're gonna have to figure out how to monetize in different, in different sorts of ways, but they're, they're watching. So the question is, can you get a new cohort of younger viewers interested in what's being served up. You can't get around that being the, the crucial part of the equation. And the idea that they're not reaching out to popular YouTube celebrities that have already figured out the equation in some ways, that they're not doing more sorts of um, town, you know, town hallish format, man on the street type format where you're direct, you're engaging directly with real people. I personally love, I think the one of the best things that cable news shows do, because they have the resources to do it, is to get six to nine people off the street in a room and get their feelings on whatever debate just happened, you know, po mm -hmm. poll testing groups, just having an open conversation that's much more analytical yeah, and Yeah, those can be very agenda-driven, though, based on who they end up picking, right? I always end up kind of skeptical of, well, how did you pick these 12 people to answer these questions? Are these representatives, are these people you know to be supportive of whatever candidate or agenda the channel or the, the poll conducting person wants that, to advance? You feel more that way about those survey groups than the hosts uh, who sit behind the desk and give their extremely no, it's the network. Same. No, it's the same. It's backing up the perspective of the host or whoever, I mean, whatever Frank Lutz type it person. Can. Certainly it can, but the point is that find that me is, Go find me nine DeSantis people to say we're done with Trump. But in practice, quite the opposite often happens. And you see in panel after panel, that the, recently they were trying desperately to find some people who said positive things about DeSantis. You could tell the slant of the channel was to try to say, oh, mo moderate regular d Republicans want to get rid of Trumpism. And even at the, they were at pro-DeSantis events, people were like, ah, I like him. I like both of them, but I, I wish he wouldn't beat up Trump and it's Trump's turn. No, I, see, I, saw, I, I watched a report on CNN about how conservatives are ready to leave Trump for DeSantis where they interviewed a bunch of conservatives on the street they picked that to me I think were totally unrepresentative because they filtered them for people who thought that even though and I, don't and I saw the way, opposite so. to the point is that we know 100% if you're talking to the host you're gonna get that view but if you talk to real people sometimes you get reality breaking through if you and the really point that I'm making people, is that structuring shows so that they talk to more real people is a good thing and much better than having this cloistered world where you're only having the elite host control the show uh, right I'm saying Okay, I, I, I'm saying the elite host, sure, but the elite host, I think, often does control the show anyway, and those things can be a, a, a laundering and filtering the views of the host through a pretext of objective 
citizenry journalism, but point taken. Yeah, well, taken. Chris liked, it's, it's a pretty significant fall from grace. Remember, he was most recently Stephen Tol Colbert's uh, late night uh, show executive producer. That show doing very well. And when he took this job, he uh, apparently said he did so because he felt it was a calling. It's interesting for someone to feel that way and to describe their motivations as being so strong without having more of a clear vision, it seems, as to the direction he wanted to, to take the show in. So we'll see what's up for him next. There is this uh, a group of interim folks, uh, senior executives, who are going to be mm -hmm. uh, steering the ship in the short term. But again, I don't think that anybody they they slot into this position is going to magically be able to write the ship I should unless the, they have this bigger cultural change. I should note the, the I think immediate uh, proximate cause of the firing is this long, I think it was like 15,000 word uh, profile of Chris Lick that was in uh, The Atlantic, mm -hmm. written by Tim Alberta, noted political journalist, um, who I, I think, who, he's a very good writer, fair, but I, I think often ends up taking down the, the person he's profiling. Mm. So even the idea to let Tim Alberta like follow you around and attend the meetings you're attending and watch you behind the scenes and watch how you're interacting in like this combative way with the staff. Like there's a lot of anecdotes about him fighting with Don Lemon or mm -hmm. saying like, what are you wearing or that kind of thing. Um, to, to not have the self-awareness to know that the piece of journalism that's going to be written about this will not be flattering. Um, to me, demonstrates catastrophically bad judgment. Yeah, it's hubris. It's the same kind of hubris that exactly. says, it's my calling to run CNN after right. coming from a late night show. Right. Yeah, <laughs> The Atlantic is going to profile me. I bet it'll all be nice things, and I'm going <laughs> to send it to my mom and pin it on my refrigerator. <laughs> nope. More rising right after this.